Um, okay, we are ready for Daniel chapter 7, uh, which is where Daniel starts getting interesting. I don't know how not interesting because the stuff that we've had up till now has been interesting, but um, it gets different. Um, the, the stories are, are less like narrative Bible type stories that we, you know, can do as flannel graphs for our kids in nursery school or, or whatever, and more um, into apocalyptic language and abstract things that, um, that stretch our understanding some and, and sometimes uh, challenge us to be able to even understand at all um, what some of the symbolism and, and um, some of the figures mean. So um, just a kind of a general statement as we, as we move through that, that kind of gets, you know, any time, uh, if I, I'll try if I'm offering like here's what I think or this is my opinion or whatever, I'll try to always, always make sure that, I, that you understand that's, um, that's kind of what I'm talking about in that time. Other times where it's, where it's more clear, especially when we have interpretation from the Bible itself, like Daniel you know, sees a vision or he has the, the understanding and then it gives the actual meaning or it gives the interpretation. I mean, that's, that's good. That's clear. But then there are other times when it's like this part of it is not really clearly defined or really clearly laid out. And here's what I think it means. I'll try to make sure that, that I'm saying those things. And if you think it's something else, that's awesome. Great. I want to hear what you have to think, think about it as well. And and we'll probably still leave being friends after you say something that you think is different than me. It's, it'll be okay. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll at times present like, here's what one writer says, here's what one writer says, here's what another writer says, and in the end, I have no idea. <laughs> that's that's going to happen some too. And it'll be okay because um, the stuff that is important that we really need to know, I think we know. And the stuff that is sometimes symbolic and harder to understand and harder to figure out, Sometimes we don't know, and I think that's okay. If God wanted us to know specifically for certain every little detail, I, I think he could have made it clear for us to where there was no question about it. So um, there are some things that, that are just, well, they're, they're just weird, or they're just different, and, uh, and it'll be okay. Um, so that kind of general, that, that serves as like a little general, general reminder for the next six chapters as we go to chapter 7 through 12. Um, that it, it is, there's, we're going to run into that kind of stuff where it's not always super clear and it's not super defined what we're going to be talking about. And that, that's kind of how it'll be, uh, for a lot of that stuff. Um, so having said that, let's dive right in, uh, because it is interesting and it's, uh, it feeds my need to speculate a lot of it. And, um, and we can, we can learn some things from that speculation as well. So we're going to jump into Daniel chapter seven. And, uh, and just start with the first eight verses that begins uh, a vision that Daniel himself has. So Daniel 7, 1 through 8. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed. Then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Daniel said, I was looking in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one resembling a bear, and it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. After this, I kept looking, and behold, another one, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And after this, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet, and it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. While I was comp contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. You ever had a dream like that? 
making this, talking about it. Um, I, I have not had that kind of a dream before. And um, what, what's different about this story compared to the dreams and visions we've seen in other parts of Daniel? It's his. Yeah, there's no, um, there's no relying on someone else to tell him the details. There's no, um, you, you know, like the first one where Nebuchadnezzar calls him in and says, you tell me the dream first and then tell me its interpretation. There's none of that. And so this is Daniel's vision, um, Daniel's dream. And when does this take place? When? Yeah, the first year of King Belshazzar's reign. So um, this is one of those structural things in the book of Daniel that sometimes causes people to pause a little bit. Who have we already seen killed? Belshazzar. He's already dead at this point. And so it's a little bit, a little bit weird from the way we think of, of how you would construct a story or how you would write a book or a, a series of events or whatever that we've already recorded Belshazzar's death, but now we're going back to the first year of his reign so that we can tell a different story. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's just, that's kind of imposing our way of thinking or our, um, our understanding of the way history should be revealed or, or reported on uh, that, um, that makes us feel that way. This, this would have been fine for the, for the way Daniel was written down or recorded in Daniel's, uh, in Daniel's day. Later on in the book, we're going to see, at the, I think at the very end uh, of the chapter, we're going to see that um, how many people does Daniel go out and tell about this dream? If you, if you look ahead to the very last verse. Yeah, he kept the matter to himself. And so um, perhaps it's only being revealed later uh, as some other things begin to take place and it's looking more and more like it's time for the children of Israel to be um, returned from their captivity back to the promised land. The 70 years of captivity is nearing its end, and Daniel says, yeah, I've got a dream I've never told you all about that goes back a few years, and, and we'll start there. So, you know, the, the specific reasons why it's out of order or uh, things like that are, are not abundantly clear, but it's, it's where it's supposed to be. And it's okay that, that we have uh, a story from Belshazzar's first reign after uh, the first year of Belshazzar's reign after uh, his death presented in the book. Um, so, so what did Daniel see? That's, that's a, a big question. What did he see? Uh, four beastesses, and they kind of get, I, I mean, in some ways, each one's weirder than the, than the pre previous one, although it starts out pretty weird. Um, you start out with one that is kind of a hybrid lion-eagle type mix, and then you move on to one that's a bear that's lopsided and has, you know, he's eaten, he's eaten his to-go order of ribs as he runs across the land. And then you got the third one is a leopard, but it has wings and four heads. And then the last one um, we'll talk more about, but it's, I mean, what kind of beast was it? We don't even know. I mean, we don't even, and I, I looked at, you know, just some artist renditions of things today as I was getting ready and, and going through some stuff, and it's like, you know, the first, first three are kind of easy to, if you know how to draw, are kind of easy to draw because they're described. The third one, or the fourth one, rather, uh, depending, on the, depending on the artist, it was a wide range of different, um, uh, you know, specters of things that they drew. And so uh, I've got some pictures to share here as we, as we go through. Uh, but... Um, here's some things written by uh, some of the some of the commentators I've I've used for this preparation. Um, Homer Haley in his in his um, book writes the four winds of heaven symbolize the strong forces which produce upheavals in society. Um, the Great Sea was not the Mediterranean Sea as you might expect um, with prophecies regarding that area of the world, but rather it's the sea of society or humanity. And out of the winds of, up, of upheaval, whether they be political, ethnic, social, or economic, various nations and forms of government develop. And so what are, the, what are the four forces that kind of mold societies? Well, it's political, ethnic, social, and economic forces that mold those societies. And out of upheaval in any one of those areas, change can be brought about. Uh, and when you see more than one of those areas in upheaval, then, then uh, big changes usually come about. 
Um, and so those four winds blowing represent the, the upheaval of, of society and the changes that will take place as a result of those things. Um, Rex Turner in his, his commentary adds, the four winds are a reflection of disturbed peoples, and they also reflect the overruling providence of God, whether by the means of angels or of men. And so um, all through the story, and, and in fact the conclusion of the story basically is God is in charge. Um, he's going to have his way regardless of all the other forces that might be at work. In fact, what other, whatever other forces are at work are under his control. Not just that he weathers those forces or that he survives those forces, but that he is in control of those forces. And so, um, you know, God is, God is sovereign is going to be one of, the, one of the primary takeaways that we get out of, out of this. And then finally, um, this one is uh, Jim McGuigan. Um, in apocalyptic speech, the wind is often used to depict the action of God, as the wind is invisible, but it clearly affects things. So it is of God who is invisible, but affects things in the universe. The sea is a common figure for nations in their restless state. The wind breaking on the sea then tells us that God is at work among the restless nations, raising up out of them the kingdoms that suit his purpose. Um, we've seen this over and over again through the prophetic book studies that we've done. Think about, think about our study of Isaiah all of last year that we went through in the, the two different sections of Isaiah. There's, you know, the chapters, I can't remember specific chapters, 24 through like 35 or something of Isaiah as we studied that was, was uh, just different prophecies against the nations around Israel. And the same, if you go back a couple of years to our study of Ezekiel, there was a whole long section of Ezekiel. That was a, um, a section of prophecies against all those nations. And so God demonstrating his power and his, his sovereignty over all of those nations is nothing new to us, um, but it's just presented in a unique way in Daniel um, through unique imagery and through unique um, um, symbolism uh, in the apocalyptic language that Daniel uses. And so, um, so th while the message is familiar, the language sometimes in Daniel is is tricky and, and different because of the, the style in which he is writing. Um, and so I look at each one of the beasts, um, that first beast, here's one, ar one artist's rendition, like a lion with eagle's, e with eagle's wings, um, but later those wings are plucked. Um, that's, you know, that's probably significant that when, when you pluck an eagle's wings, what does that do? It it grounds them, right? I mean, uh, an eagle an eagle can't fly without his feathers. Um, that it is lifted up from the earth and it's given a man's heart. And so, some of those things that um, made it uh, big and and scary and brilliant at first are some of the things that are removed later on um, as it as that kingdom winds down or whatever. Um, uh, and if we go and look, I mean, spoiler alert, these, these four beasts are four kingdoms, right? Um, and we're going to be told that later uh, in the interpretation of the dream, but the four beasts are four kingdoms. And that first kingdom, have, have we ever seen a dream, by the way, that represented four kingdoms? Yeah, chapter two, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, right? Where he had the, the dream of the big statue with the gold head and the silver body and the, uh, the bronze waist and the, the clay and iron feet and all that. And so it represented those kingdoms. And so we're having a kind of a reiteration of that, almost of that same dream here. And that was early, right? That was, Daniel was barely through his apprenticeship in chapter two, very early on in Nebuchadnezzar's reign. This is after Nebuchadnezzar has already died. This is probably uh, 50 years after that, um, after, after Nebuchadnezzar's dream that Daniel's having this dream that kind of reiterates many of those same things. It's, yeah, right. It's an interesting question, and it's it's one of those that um, I I mean I kind of kind of considered that and, and thought about that as well today as I was as I was pondering some of these things, and I don't think it's um, I don't think it's uh, a mandatory connection to be made there, but I don't think it's um, I, I don't think it's an inappropriate connection to make, um, but I think. 
I think for a lot of, well, my, my general tendency is to, is unless, it's, unless we're given reason to specifically pinpoint a detail towards a specific individual or a specific event, my tendency is to back, back off of those specific um, correlations and make it more of a overall theme type of thing. So unless there's a part of the story that requires us to think that, my tendency is to not make that connection, but I don't think it's wrong to, to consider it or to think about it. Don. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. And I, th I think we see that specifically maybe in the humbling of Nebuchadnezzar, but I think we see it in general through the way the kingdom declined after Nebuchadnezzar's death. Um, because we, and we talked about that several weeks ago with the, the way the succession went. You know, Belshazzar, it's, Belshazzar is referred to as Nebu Nebuchadnezzar's son or, or rather vice versa. Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as Belshazzar's father, but really it was a, a grandfather. And, and so there was between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar's father, there were a couple of failed rulers of Babylon. And then finally, Belshazzar's father, who I think was Nabonidus, if I remember his name right, finally um, established himself as the next king. And then Belshazzar is ruling in, ba in Babylon in Nabonidus' place. They're co-regents. That's why he, he offers Daniel the third position in the kingdom because he doesn't have authority to give. The, he, he is the second position in the kingdom. He's not in authority to give him any higher than third. So, um, so I think in general, we see a weakening of the Babylonian empire, maybe in connection with Nebuchadnezzar's humbling, because I don't think he ever, even though it says he, he gets all his stuff back, right? His, his former glory is better than his first, which is kind of a weird ending to that story in the first place. But then, from a ruler of the world standpoint, I'm not sure that he could ever quite establish the fear in the surrounding nations that he once established if after he's had that humbling. So um, it may be that the decline begins with Nebuchadnezzar's humbling. Right. Yes. And that's what's amazing. He kept, he kept talking about how mm -hmm. you could see him possibly changing his, having a change of faith. Yeah. Right? How he looks to, towards God. Yeah. And, and that would be the thing that I, I, would, I would hate to make the connection between the, the rise of Nebuchadnezzar's faith with a weakening of his kingdom. Like, because his faith increased his kingdom, I, I don't think that's the, the route we should take. I think as Nebuchadnezzar's faith increased, his glory increases. And, and we see that at the end of the story where after his humbling, he, he re achieves a greater glory. But the kingdom itself suffers after his departure, after his, his end of reign. Yeah, after his departure as king. Yeah. Yeah. Their arrogance and their, um, well, it's, isn't it interesting that at the time God needed a strong ruler in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar comes along, but at the time when we need to begin preparing for the return of the exiles, that kingdom wanes and a new kingdom comes into power that is receptive to the idea of them returning. And so, you know, I think just that, that fact fits so well with the story and the, the sovereignty of God um, that, it, that it's not surprising that we have that one awesome ruler that steps in who is really, really good at what he does, and then after him, it falls apart pretty quick. Um, that's, it's, it's not surprising if you consider the, the whole story. Um, Nebuchadnezzar and, and slash Babylon... Uh, is referred to in these passages as both an eagle and a lion at various times. Uh, Jeremiah passages, I think, um, use the phrase eagle, and that is eagle passage. 
I believe if I have those in, in my mind in the right order, uh, refer to, um, refer to, I might have those backwards, I can't remember. But um, the Ezekiel passage, verse 3, is part of a parable that Ezekiel is telling, and then verse 12 gives the, the meaning of the parable and, uh, and makes the, the connection clear between the animal that is being used and, and who it is. Uh, and identifies it, I think, specifically as Nebuchadnezzar. So, um, so it's easy. It's easy to make that connection between, first of all, the four kingdoms, because we've already seen a dream that reveals to us there's going to be four kingdoms. And here we have a dream with these four beasts. It's easy then to, to, to see how those four kingdoms are going to fit in again. And so that, that first beast represents the, um, the, the Babylonian kingdom. The second beast, like a bear... Uh, raised up on its side, has three ribs in its mouth, was told to arise and devour much flesh or much meat. Um, a bear is, uh, and this bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire. A bear is not as elegant, one, one writer wrote, um, and I thought that was an interesting word, but you think about the majesty of a lion as the king of beasts or the eagle as the king of the air, and, and they're elegant, they're, they're ferocious for sure, and they're, they're really good at what they do, a bear is just more of a brute, right? I mean, he, he does, he can, he can kill and maim and, and destroy and all that stuff, but, um, but he just kind of makes a mess of things. And so you have this bear coming in, um, and it's raised up on one side, and it's lower on the other, and it's that combination of the Medo-Persian empires where it starts out with the Mede king, but very quickly morphs into the Persian empire because the Persian portion of that kingdom was much, uh, was much stronger than the median part of that empire. So, um, so it, it fits well with that description of the Medo-Persian empire. Um, and then the ribs, three ribs represent the conquer of nations. And, and some writers try to make this, it's like three specific nations. It's the fall of Babylon, it's the fall of Egypt, and the fall of Lydia, which would, we would put in modern day Turkey. Um, and um, kind of that portion of the, the world, as they kind of devour that, it's, it's like those three kingdoms fall, uh, are the first to fall of the Medo-Persian Empire. Others label it as possibly other kingdoms. Some try to make it, well, it's not sp three specific kingdoms, it's just the idea that with that Persian onslaught, uh, even as they were devouring one kingdom, as the bear is eating those three ribs, he's told, go eat more flesh. And so as he's ingesting one nation, he's already thinking about the next one that he's going to go get. And so, you know, whether we take it to be literal three nations or whether we take it to be just a, a representation of the voracious appetite of the Medo-Persian conquerors, I'm okay with either one of those. I mean, it, it, you know, neither, neither one makes me happier than the other. And so they both kind of fit the, uh, fit the bill. Um, our third animal looks like a leopard. It's got four uh, fowl's wings, or four, four bird wings, had four heads, and it's given dominion. Um, and this represents the, the Greek empire, and a leopard being that, you know, one of the fastest cats, um, and besides that, having the four wings of a bird to help propel it forward uh, represents the speed at which Alexander the Great was able to conquer a vast, enormous area. Um, it, if, you, if you study... Uh, do, do they still talk about Alexander's conquerors in, as military history? Um, uh, you know, it's one of, the, one of the most amazing military feats uh, of world history that he was able to conquer the area that he conquered in the amount of time that he did it. And the number of kingdoms that fell before him is just astounding. Um, and so, you know, that's represented in the beast that was chosen to show, uh, to show this kingdom. Uh, the four heads, then, are the four kingdoms that, that his kingdom was divided into. Alexander the Young died early. He was early, mid-30s when he died. And um, he didn't have, uh, if he had a son, his, I can't remember if he had a son and that was, you know, woke up dead the morning after Alexander died, maybe. Um, had a young son that was not old enough to defend himself and was, you know, was wiped out as part of that purge after a king dies. Um, and then Alexander the, King, Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided up uh, amongst his four generals. And we'll talk more at length about that as we get into later chapters where that becomes more of 
um, a, a dedicated part of the prophecy about what those kind of things represent. So for now, it's just the, the four kingdoms that come out of um, Alexander the Great's conquering of that part of the world um, are represented by those four heads. And then this is, you know, this artist represents it as some kind of a big old triceratops with ten horns lizard kind of sea creature beast of some kind. Um, this, this fourth beast is just fierce. It's extremely or exceedingly dreadful. Uh, it had iron teeth uh, for crushing its uh, and devouring its enemies. And what it couldn't eat and devour, it had uh, brass claws or nails that it could tromp, you know, tread them down and tromp them with. Um, and so it, it just, it was fierce. And it, it was built for destruction and it did its job well. Um, and it had ten horns on its head. And, um, and so this, of course, represents the Roman Empire. Um, no specific animal is, um, is named as, as its representative. And this is where, if you like to speculate, boy, this is your cup of tea here because you can, you can get into lots and lots of speculation and, and every author you read is going to have a little bit different twist to whatever they think these ten horns are um, and what the one horn that rises up after those ten horns and, and uproots three of them and, and all of those things. It's all very... Um, it, well, it's all just kind of hard to understand because there's no clear reference given. There's no clear name or person given to represent the ten horns or the one horn uh, or those kind of things. And so, uh, I mean, it ranges in, in interpretation from the first ten emperors of the Roman Empire to, you know, ten later specific emperors or, uh, or some, you know, just some combination of those things. Um, or maybe the ten just means it was all of them. Um, because it was, you know, 10 is a complete number or something like that in apocalyptic language. And so, and so it's, um, maybe we're supposed to associate it with 10 specific people. Maybe we're, maybe we're not. Maybe, maybe. I, I, I just don't know. I, and I can't, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be mad at you if you decide you know and, and make it be 10 specific people. That's fine. Um, but, but I just can't, I can't be convinced by the things that I've read that it, that it's that clearly defined, um, for, for who the, the specific people need to be identified as. Um, so in general, we know it stands for the Roman empire. Um, however, that symbolism plays out and however that symbolism works, uh, is okay with me and, and it, it just represents the Roman empire. And I'll be, I'll be okay with that. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Any, any thoughts on that section? It's, uh, it's foundational for, um, for what's going to come next in the, in the vision and, and in the interpretation of the vision. And it's also related to many of the things that are going to happen in later chapters. I mean, this lays the foundation for some things we're going to see later on uh, and some connections that we'll need to come back to and, and talk about this again. So, um, Chuck? Well, the little, you know, the little horn, uh, I, I, as, you know, I don't know what else to say about the little horn. I haven't said much, but, but that's because I don't know much. Um, while I was, con so verse 8, while I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it, and behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. So, um, Well, which one? <laughs> because there were a couple. Um, and, and so I, I can tell you a few, what a few writers said. Um, uh, let's see. Rex Turner, uh, in his commentary, had 18 pages dealing with this beast and its various interpretations. So, I mean, in his commentary, he dedicated 18 pages to who, to this, you know, in parts at least to this very thing. 
Uh, Homer Haley um, declines from from uh, making it any specific emperor or group of emperors. Uh, Rex Turner, um, let's see, Rex Turner counts uh, the ten horns should begin with Pompeii and end with the Roman emperor Nero. So that's where the, the ten start with the emperor Pompeii and, and conclude with the emperor Nero. Um, the, and the little horn then is the emperor Vespasian, and I'm not, I'm not uh, as up on my succession of Roman emperors as I, as I should be. I don't know if Vespasian immediately followed Nero or not. Um, but then McGuigan, he names them. He get, here's, here's the ten that McGuigan says they are. It starts with Augustus, who, who he says was really the first Roman emperor. Julius Caesar was not an emperor. He, was, he never achieved that status. So Julius Caesar was not the first emperor of Rome, but Augustus was. Um, so he starts with Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Galba, Otho, Vitellius, Vespasian. So there's Vespasian. There's some in between um, Nero and, and Vespasian. And then Titus. And the 11th horn is Domitian, who was the emperor at the time of John's writing of Revelation. And he likes making that connection between the apocalyptic language of of um, Revelation and the apocalyptic language of Daniel so that they're talking about the same emperor while John is currently living under that emperor. So, um, it, sure, I mean, that, that works for me. Um, Rex Turner's works for me. Homer Haley's works for me. I, I just don't know. Um, and I'm not going to be dogmatic. I'm going to be dogmatic only about one thing, and that is I don't know. Um, there are, there are things that appeal about each one of them. The, the one with, uh, if you make uh, Rex Turner's list that, you know, the 10th emperor is Nero and then Vespasian, there were three kind of inconsequential um, emperors in between Nero and Vespasian. Uh, that Galba, Otho, and Vitellius all had three very short reigns because um, they all kept killing each other. And then Vespasian finally comes along and he does persecute the church. So, um, so it's, you know, I, I don't know. I could ramble on and on about how I don't know a little bit longer. <laughs> but I just don't know. Um, it fits in there somehow. Um, but whether or not we're supposed to identify them as 10 specific people or not, I just... I, I don't feel like I don't feel like we're supposed to be able to make that connection. Other guys, otherwise, God would have made it more clear, abundantly clear, that that it you know is one specific um, grouping of emperors. Um, so, uh, any other any other thoughts or questions I can ramble about? No. Okay. You looked like you wanted to say something. All right. Johnny hadn't even said a word, and I can't believe he hadn't thrown anything at me yet. Okay. <laughs> Was it T Rex? I, I saw some I saw some dragon looking things. I saw some, you know, sea like those sea creature dragon kind of things a time or two. Um, so yeah, you can look at, at weird pictures there. Well let's look at verses nine through fourteen. That, and, and as we get into the, to the interpretation later next week, by the time we get to those verses, uh, there, there are some writers that draw the connection between the, the, the little horn and the man of lawlessness in Second Thessalonians and the, the Antichrist that John writes about and the, um, um, the, the, the beast of, of revelation i mean there's there's connections kind of made through a, a series of things there that some some writers um make that connection and we'll talk about those before i tell you i don't know which one it is too so <laughs> uh so it's all good um verses 9 through 14 i kept looking until thrones were set up and the ancient of days took his seat his vesture was like white snow the hair of his head like pure wool his throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. 
Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain, and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed." Uh, so who is this, uh, let, let's describe the ancient of days. Go back to the first couple of verses in your Bible there and, and tell me what you know about this ancient of days. Okay, so the color associated here is white as snow. So the, the things, you know, white is, uh, and what are the things that are white like snow? His vesture, I'd looked that word up. I thought I knew what it was, and I did. It's his clothing. It's what he wore, his vest. More than that. Uh, clothing, and what else? His hair. The hair of his head was like pure wool. Okay, so what does white, what does that mean? His clothes were white, his hair was white. I'm sorry? Purity. Purity, Absolutely. Um, the pure garments, um, the pure white garments represent no stain or clean, uh, they're clean, no blemish, no, um, so what are, what are some other things that we read about in scripture that are without blemish? The lamb, the sacrificial lamb for, for, uh, the atonement, for the sacrifice, for all those things was supposed to be without blemish, right? And so, um, and, and we know why, because it's dedicated to God, because it's, it, it is to be associated with his purity. And so, um, so there's, there's a connection there. What about the white hair? Don, you want to talk about that? <laughs> no, what, what about white hair? Okay, age or wisdom. Um, ancient of days, I mean, that, just that name in itself kind of kind of lends you to, to thinking about some specific time frame or or uh, or age to this character and then the fact that he has the long flowing white hair and beard um, and so um, what I mean what's the significance there why <laughs> not no now there are some things I will disagree with that we can speculate about a lot of things and I'll say maybe you're right but but uh, no, that's not it. That's not it. not Santa. He's he's he has been he has been here since the beginning. He so what I mean? What's the what's the scene that we're seeing here? The ancient of days the the, the he's being attended by all these people, and then they sit down and what. The, the book is opened, right? And so what, what scene do we have playing out here? Judgment. judgment. It's a courtroom scene, okay? And so who is going to stand in judgment over these four kingdoms? Well, the one who is qualified to do it. The one who is pure has n committed none of the sins that these, that these kingdoms have committed, uh, and those sins are numerous, um, and the one who has been around long enough to know what all those sins are. He's not receiving this information by hearsay. He's not having to call witnesses. He's able to open the book, and, and he's the one that has written these things down in the book because he was here for all of them. And so, um, so all of this is, I mean, it's, you know, it's all symbolic of, of the... the um, uh, the gravity of the situation of the of the seriousness of what's taking place here. This isn't this is this is a drama unfolding before Daniel's eyes. This is not you know uh, this is is not like going to the movies and watching an entertaining film. This is 
um, this is heavy, heavy stuff that's taking place here. And so it's represented in the way that the judge here is being seen. Um, so who is it? Oh, Johnny. Right, and so the, the fire represents judgment. The, the all-consuming nature of fire represents the, the all-consuming judgment. Um, the, and it, I think it even says, um, let's see, the, 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 oh, the wheels, it's wheels. It's a throne with wheels. That, I mean, that signifies the, the, the breadth of, of where this judgment takes place. It's not confined to a kingdom. This king can move his throne wherever he wants, and he can have judgment over all kingdoms. Yes, yeah. And, and Ezekiel, yeah, Ezekiel sees that same, same thing, and, and several things of that vision with Ezekiel um, represent the, the omnipresence of God and, and that his, his sovereignty, uh, it doesn't matter that they're in Babylonian captivity in Ezekiel because God's sovereignty extends there. It doesn't matter that they've left behind the temple and the, God's presence in the temple because God, God is with them in captivity. And so there's, there's all kinds of imagery there that represents um, God's omnipresence, and that's the, the, the wheels here are part of that. Um, the, the river of fire going out from the, the throne represents, again, that all-consuming nature of God's judgment. Um, and then the thousands upon thousands, I, lo I mean, I love the, the language there, the thousands upon thousands, myriads upon myriads. Uh, of those that were in attendance before the throne. Um, and then they all sit down because, you know, what do you do when the king, or the king, when the judge walks into the courtroom, all rise, the judge walks in and sits down, and then as soon as he sits down, everybody else sits down, and then it's time for court to begin. The court is in session. So, um, and then the books were opened. So that, the books represent there the, the, the judgment uh, that is taking place. Here's one artist rendition of, uh, of what's going on here in this part of the chapter. The, all those people dressed in white sitting around the throne. The throne is on fire. You can kind of make out the, the guy in the, on the far side sitting in the throne, and then there's one standing before him. Uh, that we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, uh, so the opening of the books, we've kind of already mentioned it. The opening of the books is um, the um, Homer Haley writes, when the court was called to order, the books were open. Books symbolized the charges brought against the ones being judged and their, per and their penalties executed. Um, also, the books includes God's moral law, the violation of which had condemned the nations in the world judgment revealed by Isaiah. And then they also contain the prophecies addressed by Jehovah to the heathen um, nations via the prophets sent to Israel. So it's a culmination of all of the books. We often, we think about the book being open and that's the book of life or the book of, of names that God has written in. And, and that's specific to some passages, but in this case, the books being open represent, uh, multiple different levels of things that, that we could, uh, associate with that. Um, so, uh, so why is, at this point, in verses 12, 11 and 12, why is Daniel especially interested in the boastful horn? I mean, picture what Daniel is seeing. He's seeing this courtroom scene, which, I mean, it, we're never told that Daniel sees God in this, in this vision. Um, and some commentators make a big deal about that, that, you know, can't say he saw God, we saw, he saw an image of God, or he saw, you know, a representation of God, or something like that. Did he see God himself sitting on the throne? I, you know, I don't, I don't know if, I, I don't know that it matters whether he sees a representation of God, or whether he sees God himself sitting on the throne. I think we know who that represents. I, whoever, Daniel understands this to be a, a courtroom scene with God as the judge. And then, so he's seeing God on a throne of fire. He's seeing the myriads and myriads and thousands and thousands. Um, and what draws his attention? Chuck.
Yeah. Or, you know, he's talking against the angels of death. Yeah. I, th I think you're exactly right. I think I think that even as this scene is playing out, and this this whoever this one little horn is is about to be judged by the books that have been opened by the one that's sitting on the throne, he is still speaking forth his boastful lies. He is still speaking out, uh, you know, in his arrogance, and doesn't have enough sense to be quiet before the God of creation. Um, you know, picture uh, picture Moses at the burning bush. What did he do? He removed his sandals and fell down on his face. Right. Uh, picture uh, picture uh, uh, Peter, James, and John at the transfiguration before Christ. What did they do? They fell down on their face. Right. But here, this this little whoever it is, this little tyrant, this little person that's represented by this horn stands before God and continues to utter blasphemies and lies and boastful things in the presence of God. And, and so Daniel's attention is drawn to that, which, I mean, you, is, is understandable, right? I mean, how can this be taking place? How can he be doing this? Yeah, how could you be so stupid? Do you understand the power that he possesses over you? Do you understand the do you understand what's about to happen? Obviously, he didn't. And so this kingdom that is represented by that last horn, by that small horn, is, is in the presence of God, uttering boastful things about itself, even while God possesses the power of judgment over it. Um, and so, uh, you know, so this is a, a, just a mind-boggling scene here of things that are unfolding before Daniel. And, and he lets us know that the, I mean, his mind is boggled later on. He's, he's got, you know, he's got trouble with the things that are going on. Um, and, and then we got, so who, who approaches the ancient of days? Okay. So verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him. So back to that picture, you know, the one standing before the Ancient of Days there is, is the one who's the Son of Man. Uh, a, um, and it says, a Son of Man. So you have four kingdoms represented by increasingly weird and terrible beasts who all arise out of what? The sea, out of the people, out of humanity, out of out of, you know, the, the turmoil and chaos of human existence. And where does, where does the Son of Man appear from? In the clouds, from the clouds of heaven. So the four kingdoms that are destroyed, that are receiving judgment, arise out of man. The one kingdom that arises that is everlasting descends from where? From heaven. It originates from a different place. It's not man-made. It's not of the same origin. It's a different kingdom altogether. It's not another of the same type. Remember that from uh, our recent study of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus promised the Holy Spirit, he said, um, it, it's um, alos, alos parakletos, another of the same kind, another helper of the same kind. And, and this would be heteros kingdomonian. I don't know what the kingdom word would be. A heteros kingdom, another of a different kind. Okay, it's a heteros. It's it's different, and so um, so this kingdom is is altogether different than the kingdoms that have have been judged. Um, and then to what what happens then with this one who approaches the Son of Man? He's he is given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Well, which one of those kingdoms is he given? Which one of the four does he get? Not any of those four. Those four are all judged and, and coming to an end. He gets his own kingdom. Um, and what is distinct about this kingdom? What's different about this kingdom? Yeah, it won't be destroyed. It's going to include peoples from all nations, men of every language. The, they are going to serve him 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He's not a king that's going to eventually fade and die and be replaced by another king who may or may not be as good as he was. Uh, his, his dominion as king will last forever, um, and it will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And so how does that, again, let's go back to Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. What, what did we have in that dream that represented this eternal kingdom? The rock, the boulder that was cast down from heaven, that was cut out without man-made tools. It was made, it was a boulder made without human intervention. And so this boulder that was cast down from heaven by the hand of God destroyed the, the four kingdoms, and it rose to become a kingdom, a mountain that would never be destroyed by any earthly kingdom. And so the, the, the parallels between chapter 2 and chapter 7 are stark. I mean, they're there. You don't have to look real hard to find them. Um, but they all represent the sa- kind of the same thing. So, um, okay, so we got through verse 14. Chuck has mercifully not rang the bell yet, but he's about to because it's past time to go. But um, any, any thoughts to wrap up, Johnny? Uh, okay. Okay. Right. Done. Okay. Yeah. There is still a. There is still a. Um, a remnant of that kingdom somehow in the peoples that survive um, even the overthrow of a kingdom. I mean, who who is seeing this vision? What has happened to Daniel's kingdom? Like the kingdom that Daniel is a part of, what? Where is it? It's it's in Babylonian captivity right now, but by and large, and so. But does that kingdom remain? Yeah, it's, I mean, there's a remnant that's going to be returning. Their kingdom is going to be reestablished, even though it will never be quite like it was before. And so there is a remnant of that kingdom that persists, even after many would say it had been destroyed. And so there was still an influence that the Babylonian Empire would have upon the Medo-Persian Empire. Who, I mean, just think back to last week, who was advising King Darius? Daniel, who was a vestige of the Babylonian Empire. Who else was with him? All, many of those same satraps and governors and prefects that had been part of that Babylonian Empire. And so, um, so I would, I would my, my best thought would be that same thing, that it, would, that it was just, while their judgment, their kingdom has come to an end, there is still an influence, there is still a way in which, which the people of that kingdom have the opportunity at some point down the road to be able to be associated with the new kingdom that is coming. And so um, while the, and so here's where, here's where the symbolism gets tough sometimes with the little horn, is that a person that's being judged or is that a kingdom, an entire kingdom that's being judged that is coming to a, a, a final conclusion? Or is, is it a, is, if it's a person, then, you know, vestiges of that Roman Empire will continue on even into today. I mean, we're still influenced by what the Roman Empire did 2,000 years later. But um, that one person came to an end. I think. All right, thank you. We'll pick up with verse 15 next week, where it actually gets into the interpretation. (laughs) 